make that note. Okay. All right. So we're back in session. Um, and I hereby open our public hearing for FY20 budget. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a very important part of the budget process. Uh, once the operating budget is approved, there is an opportunity for public hearing, and this is required by um, Mass, Mass General Law process. What I'd like to do this evening is to provide a synopsis of um, a very extensive process by sharing with you um, some of the numbers contained in the FY 2020 operational budget. I'll begin by stating that the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee is committed to providing an excellent education to the youth of our two towns while presenting an educationally sound and fiscally responsible budget. The budget priorities and the mission of the Regional School Committee serve as guiding principles by creating a framework for discussions and decisions that take place throughout the budget process. Each year, the Northboro Southboro Regional School Committee identifies its budget priorities. These priorities become the budgeting areas of focus and are included in the public hearing document, which is actually on the counter behind that beautiful artwork displayed <laughs> this evening. A copy of the FY 2020 approved school committee uh, voted line item budget is available this evening as well and on our district website. Copies are also available at central office and our town offices in both Northboro and Southboro. As part of the public hearing process this evening, I will be providing the total of the FY 2020 budget by functional categories of accounting expenditures identified by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. This information is shared as stated as part of the public hearing process and once read into record, an opportunity for public comment is provided. I'll begin with function 1000, district leadership and administration, which includes the regional district's apportionment of general administration, district administration, finance, and administrative services, $688,349. Function 2000, instructional services, includes district-wide academic leadership, school building leadership, teaching services, professional development for teachers and support staff, instructional materials and equipment, instructional technology, guidance, counseling, and testing services and assessment, as well as psychological services, $11,440,824. Function 3000 other student services includes attendance and parent, li parent liaison services, health services, student transportation services, food services, athletic services, student activities, and school security, $2,029,191. It's also important to note that this amount includes student body activities budget at $97,168 offset with revenue in the amount of $50,000 for a total student activities budget of $147,168. Also reflected in this function code are athletic services which include transportation, athletic salaries and services officials for a total of $538,850 in the operational budget, which is offset by additional gate and fee revenues of $353,241 for a total athletic budget of $892,091. Function 4000 includes operation and maintenance of plant, custodial services, heatings of, heating of buildings, utility services, maintenance of grounds, buildings, food services, networking, and telecommunications for infrastructure, $1,736,088, also offset by revenues of $70,000 from issued parking permits and $10,000 from facility rentals. Function 5,000 is fixed charges. This is a district charge based on our regional status and includes employment retirement costs, employee separation costs, Insurance programs including health, life, workers' comp, compensation, unemployment and comprehensive liability, and bond insurance. Medicare, rental lease of equipment, and other charges of recurrent nature such as municipal inspections. $3,875,748. Function 7000 includes the acquisition, improvement, and replacement of fixed assets of a non-instructional nature exceeding the $5,000 unit cost and $100,000 for extraordinary maintenance, $26,000.
Function 9000 includes programs with other school districts, which include the transfer of payments to school districts or to non-public schools for services provided to students residing in the sending city or town, otherwise known as school choice or charter, in the amount of $290,000. We, we move on to the area of special education, which very much marries the regular education function codes that I just referred to. Fund 1,000 includes legal services and administrative technology, $16,800. 2,000 includes instruction, the regional district's apportionment of the director of student support services, assistant director of student support services, teaching, salaries, professional development, instructional materials, and psychological services in the amount of $2,504,494. Function 3,000 other student services includes health services and transportation not otherwise included in the Function 3,000 in the regular ed portion of the budget, $253,780. Function 4,000 includes maintenance of equipment, $2,000. Function 5,000 fixed charges in the area of special education. This includes a lease agreement of $1,595. Function 9,000 programs of a non-public school. These are generally um, student placements based on students' individual needs, $910,579. This number is also offset by circuit breaker reimbursement in the amount for the FY 2020 budget of $512,312 for a total of nine of um, non-public school budgeted amounts of $1,422,891. All of that is reflected in total of regular day programs of $20,086,200 and the total of special education programs $3,689,248 for a total approved FY 2020 operational budget of $23,775,448, which represents an overall increase of $692,490, or an incremental increase over FY 2019's budget of 3%. Okay, so. Um, this is a public hearing, so we have any uh, comments from the public? Well, seeing none, I close the public hearing and move on to the next part of the agenda. Thank you, Thank you for reading all that budget out. So the first item on the agenda is action on the minutes of the open meeting, February 27th. Paul. So I move we approve the minutes of the open meeting of February 27th. Moved by Paul uh, Butka. Second. Second by Dan Kalenda. Okay. Um, any uh, changes, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes unanimously. Okay. Um, we have no educational policy, so we're on to our new business, and uh, we have an update f uh, from the Booster Club for Algonquin. Um, if I might, by yeah. way of introduction, yeah. um, Lynn, uh, there are two members in the audience that uh, are very much connected to athletics this evening. We have a lot of guests with us for presentations, which is always exciting. Um, A.D. Massarino and uh, Tom Spataro, who is uh, the president of the Booster Organization. As we know, um, I just read into record the amount of uh, fees and revenues from gates and uh, collections and also what's budgeted in the operational budget. What is not so tangible and so transparent is the amount of support that we receive from the Booster Organization. Um, their efforts have certainly um, not only allowed us to um, provide needed resources for our teams, um, but also have provided funds for upgrades to our facilities and equipment over the years. And so uh, not always visible, but we're glad whenever they're present uh, as a sister organization. And we've started uh, formally inviting them to join us uh, at least once, if not twice a year, to just appreciate how much they've donated um, in that period of time since their last presentation. And also, um, Tom is a familiar face around Central as well. Um, if it's athletics, Tom is generally 
or recreation uh, somehow involved in, in wonderful activities and initiatives in our communities. Um, Mr. Desmond and I had the pleasure of attending one of the booster, uh, the booster meeting on Monday, and um, I'm sure Tom will be addressing it as well, but Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything on this. Uh, <clears throat> it was really just kind of an initial kickoff to the group that we talked about a few months ago where we're going to be looking at um, some field upgrades and, and I guess I think get the consultant in to help us, you know, come up with a, a master plan. So it was really just kind of a kickoff to that whole effort. So we're looking forward to good work to come. Have a seat, Tom, or do you want to stand the entire, I don't know. That Thank you for having nice me. Standing. <laughs> I guess I can start by <clears throat> just kind of giving a summary. Um, you know, boosters, there's, uh, there's about 28 team reps, representatives. Uh, we have seven uh, on the executive board. Uh, we work with Mike Mossarino, the athletic director. To, uh, on all the projects, events, and things like that. <clears throat> uh, this was my first year as president, uh, third on the boosters. I was treasurer beforehand. Um, so I think one of the things as we went over last year, how big boosters uh, really is and how much uh, <clears throat> work the, the parents do in really helping you know, where they can in uh, you know, uh, raising funds and, and things like that. On an annual basis, we raise between uh, 200 and $250,000. <clears> we, uh, a lot of that is spent on whether it's, you know, team needs new uniforms, might not be in the budget, uh, equipment. We're pro I think we spent about $63,000 this year on equipment. Um, that's new uh, wrestling mats. Uh, in the past, you know, uh, mats and. Uh, balance beam bars and things like that for the gymnastics and it really helps you know continue this great facility that we have here um, the uh, the other thing that helps uh, that we raise money with is uh, is using the facilities uh, to host tournaments um, and uh, and things like that so that actually brings a lot of money in uh, the parents will work the entire weekend in order to support and you know be at the gate and and do things like that and we can literally raise over ten thousand dollars just at those so you know it's great to have a facility like like Algonquin with the gyms and things uh, to kind of help us you know manage <clears throat> uh, so I, I mentioned about uh, one of the things I want to mention from last year uh, it was raised just to you know we we try to be careful how we raise money so um, you know, when you, when you look at the parents and they have their fee, uh, then you can have boosters. We just gotta be careful that we don't keep going to the same well. Uh, and that's one of the things that we mentioned this year uh, with existing and new reps. Um, and we also look to help the new reps. So when they were trying to figure out events and, and they're new, um, basically we, we had people there, we, we um, added one position and that position was to reach out to the reps, make sure they know what they're doing and also for us to know what they're doing, right? To make sure that the events that they're doing are in the guidelines of the school. Um, and um, I think that's actually gone pretty well this year. So, uh, so far so good. Uh, we're off to a good start. Uh, the other thing that <clears throat> we're working on is a new website. So one of the things we have today, it was a free website, it was great. But if you think about how big we are and how to manage you know, this organization, uh, we need something better. So we reached out to some friends of ours that do this professionally, uh, that know that we're a nonprofit, that work with nonprofits, um, and they're actually going to help us uh, create the website, a new website, to not only uh, just put events and things like that that we have going on, to send out the email blast to everybody to let them know what's going on, but also to have a little bit more control with the administration um, and a little more control over the events. So. Uh, the site will actually have the booster reps on there, register the events, we will get those, and then as we usually do, working with Mike, Sarah, and, uh, and uh, Christine and Greg to just make sure that everything that we're doing is in line with what the school uh, wants us to do. Um, the last thing is uh, we're excited to work with you 
on the on the policy for advertising donations and sponsorship uh, that is really going to help us you know we, we talk about all the funds raised by the by the team reps the general boosters has a golf event in June uh, it's Tuesday, June 18th for everyone. <laughs> um, it's a lot of fun. It brings the uh, booster community together. Uh, you know, not just current players, current parents, also, you know, some of the alumni are starting to come back. And we're really trying to push to get more of that so we can, uh, you know, the, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so we look forward to that. But uh, the, the policy will really help us do a lot, right? So you're looking at the website, you're looking at this policy, things like that really help give us the tools not just to do really well now, but when folks like myself drop off, the new folks have an easy way to just fall into a system that they can continue to do what we're doing. Great, thank you. Um, it, the booster organization is invaluable in uh, all, the, all the support you provide to the school and, and really appreciate um, the efforts that you've made to make sure we're coordinating um, with, you know, with our policies and working with us, um, that's, uh, we very appreciate that very much. So um, thank you and thank all the volunteers and for stepping up um, and spending their time to help the program. And as you said, a lot of the things that you spend, it, you know, it's not in our budget. It's, um, it's things that, uh, you know, equipment that's outside of what we do and and uh, it's very much appreciated in, in helping us keep the program. Dan. Sir, did you say you're a 50, are, are you a 501c3 nonprofit? Yes. Do you have a matching gifts uh, program for those who donate and their companies will match one to one, sometimes two to one? We don't right now. We don't right now. But once we get, once we get this, we'll, and we know what we can do, um, we'd be willing to look at that and everything else. One of the things we went over at the meeting um, is to make sure the, the folks on Team Boosters know that it's, it's not just the seven folks on the executive board. You know, they do a lot with their teams, but it's really to get the whole community to do things like that. I work for a company. I should be going and asking for that and things like that. So we don't do that today, but we, we, should, we should push for something like that. Okay, I think that would be really helpful. You could mm -hmm. dramatically increase your uh, donations that come in from people whose employers will match an employee's gift. So mm -hmm. you can look into that and when you're ready for it. I think that'll make a, an even larger improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy. And as somebody who's worked on the advertising policy, um, we greatly value your input because uh, we want to make sure that the policy is comprehensive. At the same time, we don't want to, you know, it to be 100 pages but um so any input that you could could give us in terms of what if scenarios you know, like what if we wanted to do this what if we wanted to do that would be helpful because then you know our policy could guide what we know is coming down the, the track so um so we look forward to working with you okay no i appreciate that and we appreciate you guys coming the other night i got a lot of it was well received and just the fact that uh with, with paul that they really liked to that their voice was heard that they heard kind of the things that you guys were doing. So mm -hmm. thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. We have uh, the thank policy you. up. Stop. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next we have our fine performing arts presentation. We have some students in the uh, out there with um, ready, to go. ready to go with music uh, instruments. Oh, ready to be entertained. <laughs> Work song by the Irish Marines. All right. Thank you. 
a freshman, Jason Gogan, senior on drums, Ethan Cardillo on guitar, junior, Justin Moyer on trumpet, a senior, Mateo Oyola, a junior on alto sax, and Scott Alberti, a sophomore on trombone. <laughs> Do I need to speak? All right, so um, at Algonquin, we offer a comprehensive curricular program in the areas of art, drama, and music. Students have the opportunity to choose from 34 course offerings. All of our courses are electives, and uh, the graduation requirement is either two and a half credits, which is half a year, in our department or in the Applied Arts and Technology department. As students work in the arts, they develop self-discipline, self-esteem, persistence, motivation, <coughs> they're challenged creatively, and perhaps most importantly, they have the opportunity to discover, explore, and enjoy their spark. Sparks are interests or passions that give young adults a sense of purpose, energy, and joy in life. We feel strongly that however one participates in the arts, they are a source of great enjoyment, and they contribute significantly to one's quality of life and emotional well-being. Our staff and students are always happy to share their talents or their sparks with the community of Northborough and Southborough. Most recently, the National Art Honor Society held a paint night to celebrate Arts Week and Youth Art Month, which is the month of March, at Algonquin. Nearly 40 painters of all levels and ages attended. Our art students had the chance to mentor their peers and teachers guiding them outside of their comfort zone to a place where our young artists feel most at home. Also part of Arts Week and Music in the School Month, also the month of March, the music department held our annual Jazz Night. We invite a special guest in to work with our high school groups and the middle school groups from Trotter Melican and present a concert in the evening. That's the Melican Jazz Band you see right there. Our guest this year is Doug Olson. He's a freelance trumpeter of over 25 years, and he currently serves as Interim Director of Jazz Studies at WPI. Our art program offers a variety of offerings in both 2D and 3D art at the CP Honors and AP levels. For the 2019-2020 Program of Studies, we've updated our course name of 3D Design to Sculpture 1 and 2. And we are also swapping out digital photo with digital photo journalism as an offering. Digital photo journalism will involve students using their smartphones and cameras, much like a professional journalist, to capture exciting newsworthy moments here at Algonquin or in the community. Our art students have been sex successful in recent competition in honors, such as the um, Gold Scholastic Festival. Uh, since I presented last, students received seven 
gold keys, two silver keys, and eight honorable mentions. The gold key, gold key recipients go on to the national level. And last year, we had a student, Elsa Ray, receive a gold medal at the national level for her photo titled Refuge, which you can see here. Our school's strong reputation in the arts paved way for an invite to the Work Times Family Project with the Working Assumptions Foundation in California. Many Algonquin Photo One students shared their honest perspectives of the overlap of work and family life with, within their own households through the use of photography. Many students received awards for excellence. And some of this work, in addition to those photos you see there, are in display currently now in the rotunda. Our dedicated staff also devote many hours outside of the school day um, for extended opportunities for our students. The Memory Project is a great opportunity for our National Art Honor Society students to spread kindness, hope, and positivity through their artwork. Our students create portraits as gifts for children facing challenges in other countries. They receive a photo of a child, and then they can use any medium to create a portrait, which is then sent back to the child. The culminating celebration for all of our art students is our end of year spring art show. These are some pictures from last year's show. Um, the spring art show will open this year on May 14th, and we hope that you all can attend. I would now like to invite senior Leah Grimbladis, sorry Leah, uh, to share a little bit about her experiences with you and some of her artwork, which is displayed right over there on that partition. Hi, um, I'm Leah. I'm a senior. Um, art at Algonquin, I think, has impacted my life way more than any other class or any um, department that I've taken here at Algonquin. Um, it's kind of showed me what can be accomplished when there's a group of people, teachers and students, who care about something so passionately. When it's more than just taking a test and proving that you know something, but proving to yourself what can be done and what you can achieve when you really want to do something and when you want to see what you can accomplish. Um, I think since we first started Algonquin, um, we're kind of told to think about our future and think about college. And I can say from experience that do, going through these college interviews, I can tell them about all the AP classes I've taken, all the sports I've played, um, all the clubs that I've done. But what makes Algonquin different and what makes it us students more um, respected, I think, by these college counselors is that we have this whole art culture at our school. And we have all these classes and all these teachers, not just um, kind of a traditional art path, but all these different things that we can do. And we can tell these colleges about them and they're so impressed with us as students, with our school, and it makes us kind of stand out. And we're not just any school here in Massachusetts, but we have our own art thing going for us and it's really impressive when they look at what we can do and how we're so much different than most other schools just because of our art. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, our second area of study in this department, drama. So we offer three different courses of study, and public speaking continues to be a popular course that's interdisciplinary with our social studies department. In addition to our courses, we have um, many opportunities, a variety of performance opportunities outside of the classroom. We've already had a very busy and successful year. Chicago High School Edition was a hit. We had 54 student cast and crew, 16 member student orchestra, and a production team razzled and dazzled the audience in a high level, professional, and polished performance. This year's winter show, Proof, proved to be a valuable experience for all involved. The entire show was performed on February 28th and March 2nd for receptive audiences who had the chance to ask the cast questions about their characters, the script, and their experience following each show. A third performance of Act One Only was entered into the Mass High School Drama Festival, which we hosted here at Gonquin for the first time on March 1st in the Black Box. The festival gave the cast and crew the opportunity to meet theater students from visiting schools and view their shows. 
Our crew is responsible to help tech these other shows. In Algonquin won the prestigious Ensemble Award, where four cast members were celebrated with awards. Most importantly, we hosted a dynamic afternoon and evening of theater, where students were given verbal feedback from veteran theater professionals who both supported their choices and gave um, suggestions for improvement. To speak a little bit more about drama, I'd like to invite one of the stars of Proof, Catherine Moffa. Hello, so I'm a senior. Um, throughout my entire time at Algonquin, I've taken part in the um, drama department, if you'll call it. Um, and I'm so glad I did. I absolutely love theater so, 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 so much. I can go on and on about it, but I have just a little time for you guys. Um, so I really think that um, this school has helped me to grow so much as a performer and as a person, more importantly, I think. On the performance side, we're really held to a high standard and we're given challenging material. Um, like in Chicago this year, I had to memorize an entire monologue in Hungarian. That was a challenge, to say the least. Um, and for proof here, that was um, 72 pages of dialogue I had to memorize. And that was wrought with like adult themes and <coughs> mature language. And so I think it really says a lot that we were, as students, able to handle that kind of material. On the personal side, I know I've grown so much thanks to the adults and students involved in this program. There's so much support and love for each other. It's really a community. And um, I don't think I'd be the confident person I am today without them. And one last thing I'd love to say is drama at Algonquin is so different. Like I'm telling you, it's cool here to <laughs> do drama, which is rare. <clears throat> um, and people want to get involved, all different kinds of <coughs> students. And I think that's so awesome because you have all different kinds of students, all this diversity, and they're all coming together to enjoy theater and share it with our community, and I think that's so valuable. Yeah. All right, music. In the music program, we're very fortunate to be able to offer eight performing ensembles during the school day. In addition to those ensembles, we offer courses in jazz improv, music theory, and piano and guitar. Over the past two years, we've uh, developed and participated in three exchanges from the Northborough Southborough Music Programs. Last year, we had Bandorama with Northborough Instrumental Program. We had 495 band students all perform in a concert that showcased um, their talents by grade level. Students and parents were able to experience the dedication and musicality of our students as they progressed through the curriculum from grades five through 12, all in an hour. <laughs> This fall, we created the Pep Band Exchange, where we invited eighth grade musicians and their teachers to come up and rehearse with the Pep Band and perform at a football game. It was a great introduction for our eighth graders to see the opportunities that we have here at the high school for them. It was really well attended, and the energy and enthusiasm was um, awesome. And in January, we held our second ever Stringarama with Southborough, just like Bandorama. It's an audio snapshot of our string curriculum. Perhaps the most exciting part of the night, which you can see here, is when all of the students, grade three through 12, all played a grand finale together. So at this time, I have one more student to present. Um, I'd like to welcome up senior Zachary Entwistle. He's gonna play um, the oboe for you and speak a little bit about his music experiences.
So I would like to talk about the opportunities that the music program has given me. Um, first off, at the fall concert this year, I was able to have my original music composition performed, which was a dream come true for me because I've been composing music since I was 11 years old, <laughs> and I've never had an opportunity like that. So it was really cool that the that the concert um, that the wind ensemble could play my piece, and also through the um, instruction from my teachers in the music program, I've been able to improve my skills at oboe. And I've, through that, I've been able to participate in the Central District's orchestra, in the Worcester Youth Orchestra, and of course, the school's full orchestra and other ensembles that we have here. Also, I think that the music program teaches skills that no other class can, because I, when I was a freshman, I used to be extremely shy. But through playing the oboe in the school band, I had to play a lot of solos in front of huge audiences. And through that, I've been able to grow my confidence immensely. And I don't think I've been able to do that in any other class besides um, wind ensemble. And especially, the music program provides balance for me. So I take a rigorous course load here at Algonquin. I take six AP classes over the course of my um, career. But Band seventh period in my schedule was always really important for me because it gave me a chance to actually um, enjoy my passion, which is music at school. And I actually was accepted into Brown University this year, and I devote that almost entirely to my involvement in music because it was such an important, huge part of my application, and I think it's really what set me apart from everyone else. So I just wanted to say thank you for listening and for everything you do for the music and performing arts community here. So as you can see, we have numerous opportunities, Zach mentioned a couple of them, for our students outside of the music classroom. <clears throat> Last week, we hosted the MAJE Jazz Festival here at Algonquin. Jazz 2 received a silver, and this is a picture of Jazz 1, who received a gold medal. And they will advance to the Mass State Finals, which is, are this weekend. So we wish them luck, or as you say in the music world, break a leg. Our curriculum, uh, curricular ensembles continue to participate in the MICA Festival every year. And last year, we made Algonquin history when we had all four of our instrumental groups receive gold medals at MICA. The concert band, string orchestra, symphonic band, and wind ensemble all were invited to perform at Mechanics Hall as part of the gold medal showcase. It was an amazing opportunity and, and thrill for everyone. For many of our students, it was their first time being at Mechanics Hall, and they got, in my opinion, the best seat in the house. They were on stage performing for um, a great audience. So while our programs are very successful, we feel like we can be reaching more students during course selection, we spent a great deal of time advocating for our courses and discussing the benefits of making room for the arts in your schedule. Discussions with students and parents have shown us that students are concerned that they must load their schedules with heavy academic courses, which can then unfortunately eliminate room in their schedule for the arts. It's troubling to us to have students take that spark out of their school day, something that they're talented in, uh, something that can relieve pressures and stress in their life and something that they are um, unique and creative that sets them apart from others. This quote here from Stanford Admissions, she reminds students that the curriculum they cho choose should be one that challenges them, but also one that inspires them and helps them to develop their unique passions. We've been working with guidance and students on creating balanced schedules with room for the arts, but there's more work to be done in this area. The confines of the daily schedule, singleton classes, meeting course requests, and building the schedule are all topics we'll continue to look at as we advocate for our students to make room for the arts. We truly want to see every student able to fit our courses into their schedule. In fact, National Arts Honor Society and Triumph, the Music Honor Society, created campaigns encouraging their peers to make room for the arts. We created an Arts Week where students could stop by and experience a taste of the arts at Algonquin. During all lunches, students demonstrated live music, drawing, painting, and wheel throwing demonstrations. And our students were happy to share their passions or their spark with their peers during this experience. So I thank you for your time tonight um, and for giving me the opportunity to share some of my spark and passion about the Fine and Performing Arts Department and allowing our students to share their voices as well. Thank you.
Thank you. It's, uh, I always enjoy um, when you come and you see all the work of the students and performances. And uh, I know it's, it's uh, very important for many students to be able to um, have this creative outlet. And as we know, I, you know, music is um, very beneficial for math skills and um, other, you know, things like that. I, um, and uh, it's, very, it's something that we can be proud of. So any um, comments by Catherine? Yes, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a professor at Berkeley College, for those who do not know. Um, my work outside of the school committee and neuroscience is very, very hot in looking at music and the impact it has on uh, development of the whole child and particularly cognitive development. And the phrase that keeps getting used is optimal brain potential uh, maturation because of the arts. So um, it's, it's a joy to have this amount of activity. I actually moved to this community because of the arts program. Um, and I feel very strongly about advocating for it. And my husband and I co-founded the Solar Jazz Festival, in which we have uh, the Jazz Ensemble of Algonquin performing with three other professional bands. Um, because, and there's Mr. Vincent in the back, uh, who's been very supportive um, in bringing his groups, because they absolutely have a place. Um, and we also like to teach that if you have the microphone, what noble and important thing will you have to say with your music and with the amplification? So in this case, we um, do it with environmental sciences. Um, and it's a reminder of how much music and science are more alike than different. Um, and actually, the involvement in the arts promotes that. And I think Zach left, but I'd have to say I very much liked his composition. I heard that um, in the house that night. And I'd very much like to applaud Ms. Collins and her staff and all the work that they do and the opportunity for arts to be more inclusive and not it be a talentocracy where only the talented get in because talent is undefinable. But everybody is born with the potential and it should be educated like any other potential in linguistics or cognition. So congratulations. Oh. So they probably told you I, I do this, but thanks very much for this for the presentation and the, and the, the performances I thought were terrific. I, I thought that the, the students were, were all well spoken as well. So I ask every every department head this, you know, are we giving you everything you need? Are all the kids that want to subscribe to the different classes, are they are we turning away a lot because we're too full? Are we, you know, are there things that that we could do to help the program, you know, with no guarantees that we do it, but, and, and in fact, the budget now is, is pretty much laid to rest, but, you know, just as guidance for us as we prepare the next budget, because there's always the next budget. And it, it just kind of never stops, so. Sure. Um, it's kind of a multi-layer question for me, and um, I alluded to it a little bit with um, scheduling opportunities for students, the conflict that we're finding, um, within the, the schedule we have, students feeling the need to um, fit prerequisites in for other courses, um, doubling up on some subjects, perhaps it's not the value, um, they're not finding the value. In our own um, graduation requirement, there is no requirement. A student can graduate from our school and never have taken an arts course. Um, I'd love to see more students involved, and maybe that's a pathway we can um, pursue in the future. Um, we'd be Mass Core compliant if we had a uh, full year requirement for um, the visual or fine arts, uh, performing arts. Um, also, um, you know, we're we're losing some numbers in our upper level classes because they're often singletons, which is a natural progression. You have. Um, lots in the beginner level, fewer um, move on to the next level. And if that next level class runs at the same time as another competing singleton, we tend to lose. Um, and that can hurt the program. So um, that, that, that's where my um, biggest challenge is um, with our program right now, 
in, as far as support and figuring those things out. Right. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. I think I think I get it. <laughs> in question outside of the budget, as we heard tonight, in terms of athletic fundraising, how does what are you able to achieve with the parent music association for external funding? Sure. Um, so in our department, we do have a the Northboro Southboro Music Association. So they do not um, fund art or drama. They are strictly f fund music, and they fund music um, K through 12. So it's not just Algonquin. So they've been very um, gracious and generous in supporting some extra expenses, uh, equipment, um, pricey coral risers that wouldn't fit into our new equipment budget, um, coral attire um, when we transitioned over. They do a lot of scholarships, which is wonderful. Um, my favorite scholarship they do is they provide private lesson scholarships for our students. I see that as paying back into the program um, because it boosts the level of the musicians we have here, makes a better experience for all involved, um, opposed to senior scholarships are wonderful. Um, you know, we have lots of students who go on and pursue music or don't and still qualify for a scholarship, but it's that investment back into the program, their private lessons, that's where a lot of their funding is going, and I think that's very beneficial. Do you know how much they raise a year? All their, um, all the money they raise is through memberships. Mm. Um, it's not, it's $100, or $50 a family. Yes, I think it is. Um, so I, I don't know the figure off the top of my head. Kathy. Hi, thank you. Um, and my daughter actually has. She's taken photography, art, she's taken drama. Mm -hmm. And she tries to fit those into her schedule every single year because it's something different. Right. And she's with different kids who she doesn't normally mm -hmm. hang out with. And she's gotten to know a lot of great people. So it's been great. Thank and, you. She's loved, and she just learned how to um, develop pictures last mm -hmm. year. So her whole wall and her room now are all the pictures that she took with her photography class. That's great. Yeah. Paul. Uh, thanks for being here. And I, I particularly like that quote from Stanford there towards the end. And I'm just wondering, how would you counsel a student who maybe like going into a junior year uh, is taking some like course, wants to drop course to take you know psychology or something like that, and and won't have any arts or you know anything fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have this conversation a lot with the students. Um, every year around this time, um, students torn with a, a difficult decision. Should I continue on in band or chorus or orchestra? Should I take the arts class? Should I, should I drop it? What, what is that going to look like? And the number one thing I always ask them is like, well, what, what makes you the most happy? You know, where are you going to find that balance in your life? Um, what do you want to pursue? beyond high school. And it's not a coincidence that many of our um, students are also the brightest students in the school. And they are very interested in um, taking challenging curriculum. So I often ask them, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And what makes you the most happy? Um, generally, they're most happy taking our courses. That, 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 is, that is true. They feel comfortable there. They feel they are thinking another way. They're with like-minded peers. Um, they're enjoying performing. They're enjoying developing film. Um, I'll, I'll counsel them to make the decision based on what they think is best for them. But I also bring um, attention to, say, they're going to be pursuing business or science um, in college. They're going to be taking business and science classes in college they may not have the opportunity to be in a program like we have with the arts, in a chorus, in a band, once they move on to that, that next level. And that's the beginning for them when they go on to college with what they're gonna study then. Take, uh, take the time now to enjoy the opportunity of what we have to offer here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathleen. So, um, so thank you, that was the most fun presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so at the last presentation we had uh, applied arts, I said that uh, I honestly felt that that was the probably the most important um, department and presentation that we'd had because I felt like that department was reaching kids that were looking for relevance and you know weren't necessarily the high performers. But I think that this department is just as valuable and just as um, crucial to I think the success of all all of Algonquin and the, the fact that I mean these. These 
students year after year after year. I've seen a lot of these <laughs> presentations, and it boggles my mind year after year the talent that um, that yeah they probably inherently have, but that you draw out of them, whether it's art or music or drama. And we consistently uh, win awards and medals and, and honors in every one of those. So I just hope that long after I'm gone, <laughs> that we continue to, um, to nurture this program and your department and all the students who, you know, like, like he said, seventh period is his, the best part of his day. And I think that's true for a lot, a lot of students. And I hope that we always keep that in mind whenever we're talking about budget and curriculum. Dan. I can't agree uh, more. It was, I, like Kathleen and others, I've been to a number of presentations here and this is a highlight. <coughs> that was absolutely outstanding what these uh, students are able to do. Public speaking and public presentation is a tough thing to do. Ladies, outstanding what you did. I mean, I can't imagine thinking back when, um, you know, a few years ago when I was a, uh, in high school, <laughs> <laughs> whether or not I would be able to stand up in front of uh, a school committee on TV and be able to talk about, you know, your passion about art, your passion about drama, and I am incredibly impressed. So well done, ladies, and Ms. Collins, tremendous. Thank you so much for that. Sean. Um, I, I, I like the slides. There was a, a lot of terrific parts of that, but um, I know it takes a lot of work to coordinate with the elementary schools and middle schools to vertically align and have performances, but I think that is um, so important on many levels that it, it it's, it's a selling point for students. It also shows like the level they can achieve um, and some mentorship and pieces there. So I know that takes a lot of coordination, but I think it's a, 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 a huge component in uh, celebrating the program and, and building it from the bottom up. Good point. Yeah. I mean, I, I echo every, everyone's, what everyone has said. And, you know, I've, my kids have been out of school, obviously, for a while and engaged, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I still go to the performances. It's like my entertainment. I love, I, Chicago was immensely entertaining. It was, it was so good. And, um, and the kids were just so talented. It was great to see the, the kids in the orchestra playing. Um, I know, you know, my daughter, that was her. She just said that I just talked to her because um, she came home that weekend after Chicago, and I said, oh, there, the kids were playing. He goes, I loved playing in the orchestra. That was like the most fun thing I ever, of all the things that she did at Algonquin, and um, you know, it was that you know, camaraderie, working with the drama, the musical, like the whole teamwork kind of thing of all together. And um, it's great that and, you know, the kids are doing that because uh, one of my friends <clears throat> had come to one of our performances um, a few years back, and they commented that, wow, your kids play in the orchestra. We have, you know, professionals playing in the orchestra. That's so great. And, um, you know, so, and they're so good, and, you know, and uh, so it's something that sets us apart, and, and um, I think, I think, that we need to support this program, whatever we can do, um, you know, and hopefully, you know, it's always going to be a challenge for kids trying to fit it in and getting their priorities. And they've, but I think it's essential to have something in the end of the day where, you know, you're doing what you love, really love. And, um, you know, you, you need to develop that for later on in life to have when you're working every day and that you still have that hobby or whatever that you love. And this is where we can nurture it. So thank you. OK. So we next have a program of studies uh, guide review. I think this is probably a good segue to turn it over to Principal Walsh. Um, yeah. Because the next three items really are about um, 
the work at the high school and in fact our annual reviews of the program studies guide the student handbook um, those very important documents and Amy alluded to that a little bit earlier how much how very vital what's in that program studies guide is to the selection program selection um, of courses for students there are a number of folks here are you going to talk about those yes. topics yep so we have this Sarah Walsh show and Michelle T's on there oh Okay. We'll share the mic. Sure. Kind of pass it back and forth. Uh, it's shutting down on you for fun. It's only because everybody's staring at us. Start it back up. While, while the computer, oh, yeah. Sarah and I prepare to dance. <laughs> <laughs> She's speaking of the arts. Yeah, speaking of the arts, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> nice job, Amy. <clears throat> so the computer's just rebooting, but uh, we have the opportunity in working with Lisa and all of our department chairs. We're going to review our course selection. Um, Lisa's prepared a phenomenal PowerPoint that I will dance with her as we do this. We'll give you an overview of the timeline. And all that goes into the scheduling that, again, was alluded to earlier, um, the conversations that happen back and forth between myself and the department chairs and each of the members within each department, how to grow departments in their course selection offerings. Just because we offer it doesn't mean that we're going to run it. Some updates on GPA, um, and Lisa has some updates on rank. So, and the course scheduling timeline is literally a year event and we hear Christine talk a lot about the budgeting you know once the budgets passed we immediately start preparing for the next year high school scheduling is very very similar we once we have the schedule set for the following school year we begin the work again so you know you're live right everybody can see okay. no videos of us dancing okay great Let's kind of hold it. Terry, if we hold it in between us, we'll be good. Okay. Yeah, looks great. I don't think it does the clicky for us. Okay. All right. It's just angry. So if you just click anywhere on the screen, <laughs> it's just mad. It's tired. All right, so good evening. I thought one of the first things that we might um, just kind of do an overview on is the actual course selection process before we jump in to the program of studies and the changes for this coming year. I think lots of times people don't always understand the mysterious process that we go through to create student schedules um, that are released in August. But we, like Sarah already mentioned, this is a very long process that we go through in um, developing the program of studies. And we hand the materials out actually right before Thanksgiving to the department chairs um, to begin having discussions within their department about what courses they might want to offer for the coming year, any changes that they might like to make for their department, um, and if they want to offer any new courses. All right, so they have that, they do, undertake that process from like Thanksgiving to like mid-January. <coughs> and then the material, all that information, they meet with Sarah, they collaborate with Sarah regarding the changes, and then all that information comes down to guidance and we just, you know, do all the updates, um, update the program of studies. And then we typically, early February, we start the course selection process with students and parents. Um, the first part of the process is, of course, our incoming ninth graders, so we have our eighth grade parent mm -hmm. night. Um, we also collaborate with the middle schools around the course selection process, any changes, updates um, for their students as they're working with their students in the middle school to prepare them for the high school. We then, after we come back from February vacation, we start working with our students and parents on the course selection process. And the guidance counselors go in and do presentations and workshops you know, talking about the course selection process, graduation requirements, we spend a lot of time, we work with our sophomores around career exploration, their interests, potential majors, getting them to think about courses that might relate, 
and you know planning to have put those courses on their schedule so they can start to kind of further explore some of those interests before they even leave the high school um, and we have actually gone online completely online with the course selection process so our students and parents have access to ipass i parent and i student and we do the entire course selection process through um, ipass Counselors right now, are, we've done all of that. We've completed that entire process. And right now the counselors are kind of reviewing all of the requests with the students and just double checking things. At the end of the month, we will turn over all of the requests to the department chairs. And then we'll start making determinations about what's going to be running for the coming year. They'll have conversations with Sarah about offerings for their particular department. So like Sarah said, in, within the program of studies, those are potential courses that we would, might offer next year. But depending on the requests that come on, in from the students, that will determine whether or not we actually run a course. And many of you heard last year, this is the second year for Algonquin to do online scheduling. It's not available for our eighth to ninth grade transition, but those have those critical conver conversations, those face-to-face -face conversations still going on. For the online course selection, Lisa's done some phenomenal work. She set the platform up last year, it was a successful rollout. Mm -hmm. Some additional um, APTO parent presentations so that we could facilitate the online use. It really mimics what students would do beyond Algonquin when they're doing their course selection work at the college level. We come back from um, April vacation and we spend you know, the bulk of the time working on the development of the master schedule yes. and conflicts resolving any conflicts within it. So we did provide everybody with, I think, an electronic copy and a hard copy of the program of studies along with a sheet that kind of covers the changes. A lot of the things that are covered within the program of studies, of course, are gonna be our graduation requirements. I just put a few bullets up here, teaching assistance, overrides, just little um, procedures, <coughs> course, like course change guidelines, our course levels, honor roll, GPA, summer school, and then of course the bulk of the program of studies is the course offerings for each department. So Lisa was provided a list of the actual changes just to facilitate the work tonight so you can understand what was different from last year to this year beyond just the cover. We have a new white cover versus the traditional yellow. I think it's a new cell. Yes. Um, one of the things that we discussed uh, in working with guidance was just clarifying some of the great promotion language. Um, Algonquin believes in social promotion practices and keeping students with their peers and those connections, those really strong connections. Um, and so, so through some great work that Lisa did with her team, they updated the grade promotion so that it aligned more with the work that was going on on the day-to-day -day work. So we just changed the wording because previously, I think when it was developed, it, they just took the required um, number of credits and divided it in half and said, in order to move on to uh, you know, become a junior upper school, you have to have earned 55 credits. When in fact, when you look at the process, the majority of our kids do earn 60 to 70 credits by the conclusion of sophomore year but they can still stay on a four-year graduation track and stay with their peers, um, and they have to earn a minimum of 40 credits. So we just aligned the wording um, to align with our practice of social promotion and keeping students with their peer group. Another update that we put in there, we, previously we did not have anything in the program of studies that kind of outlined what a teaching assistant is. Yet we have several teachers who have teaching assistants. And so we created this to be able to just try to have some consistency among educators with their work with teaching assistants. So this is pretty general, just saying, highlighting how much we value teaching assistants and the experience that that can bring to the student in the classroom. Um, and as a leadership team, SBLT is currently developing, you know, kind of a protocol of do's and don'ts for a teaching assistant um, that we will be sharing out with students and teachers later on in the year. But we wanted to add this in here um, as part of the course offerings. Excellent. And Michelle T. Tontadonato is uh, the chair of that subcommittee work, and we will actually be revisiting it tomorrow, <clears throat> continuously improving our process. So we did have to add this um, AP registration as part of um, the program of studies. And we had to add this into the program of studies based on the change in protocol through College Board. So now College Board is requiring all high schools to submit 
um, their, the number of exams that students are going to be taking in November, the beginning of November. Previously, we used to be able to submit the, um, our exam totals at the end of March, like right now. We're just finishing up the AP registration process for this coming spring. But College Board has changed their protocol, so we wanted to make sure that we were informing students and parents of this change, that it's not something that we're requesting that they do, it's something that we actually have to do. So we added this um, under the AP part. We also put it underneath each of the AP course offerings just to make sure that as students and parents are reading about the AP, they might miss this in the, in the first few pages of the book, but if they're reading about an AP course and maybe a prerequisite for that course, they're s noting that there is a change in policy and protocol for College Board. In the program of studies, you will notice that there are two grade scales. There is the grade scale uh, for our current sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and there is the grade scale for our current freshman class. This work um, on updating our grade scale started a few years ago. There was a committee working on it. They did um, extensive research on it. And what we noticed in looking at our um, previous grade scale that's currently in place for our sophomores, juniors, and seniors is that from a CP level to an AP level, there was a 1.5 GPA point difference. So there was um, a difference in equity and fairness in how we were weighting our CP classes versus our honors and AP classes. Traditionally, most schools have a 0.5 difference between the two, whereas we had a one point difference between CP and honors, and then a 0.5 difference in addition to that to the AP. So what does that mean? A student in an AP class could earn a D, um, and that would equate to a B minus in a CP class, almost a two grade difference, really pushing, um, really creating uh, some inequity on the levels. So this grade scale creates equity where you have that 0.5 difference between CP and honors and honors to AP. It promotes students to take chances, whether it be to take an honors course, an AP course, or CP course, um, and have that opportunity to not be concerned about the difference in grade weighting. In addition to that, between the levels of CP, honors, and AP, we continued that equity work when we looked down the grading scale through the actual letter grades from A to F. So when you look at the old grading scale, you will notice that there is no A plus and no D minus. And when looking at that, the amount of academic work done at, to earn a 93%, which is an A, was equivalent on the old grading scale to what it took to earn a 97%. But as all of us know, there's a significant difference in the amount of academic work required to make those differences in overall percentage gains. So we added the A plus to make sure that we were properly um, recognizing that student achievement. And then if you look at the D minus, there's a significant difference when it comes to earning a 59, which equates to an F on the current grading scale, versus a 63. There was no D minus, so a student with a 63 or lower would earn an F. Now we've equally rated, weighted every letter grade, and students are being rewarded for the work that they were able to put forth um, and obtain that passing grade for maybe that marking period that they struggled and to not walk away with an F, but still make forward academic progress on that. So now the new grading scale, which will do, be a slow four-year rollout, so it stays consistent with each cohort, is with the current freshman class, and it will follow them up next year to the sophomores, the juniors, and seniors. Along with that, this is the first year, um, this is the first class, the class of 2019, um, where we have officially eliminated rank of our students. Um, I think right now we don't have the data to kind of share out with you around the impact that that's having. You know, students are starting to get a lot of really great news. I actually just got an email from a pretty competitive school before I came here telling us that we're gonna get two more, we're gonna have two students admitted there, which is exciting, but it doesn't come out till Friday, so I can't say where or who. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so I mean, of course, the whole point of eliminating rank was 
you know, we did extensive research. I mean, we came and did an entire presentation, you know, to the school committee around, you know, rank and the importance of eliminating, eliminating it and how we were one of only a couple highly um, competitive schools left in the state who were ranking their students and how we were disadvantaging them in the admissions process, especially when the admissions counselors, you know, are doing a holistic read. If they have any criteria around a, a definite percentage that's a cutoff, we were really disadvantaging our kids, you know, who we're talking could be like, you know, point, you know, one off from one another. Um, so we've made the decision, you know, through our work to eliminate rank, and we are excited to see the results at the end of this year for our students. So far, we've been getting some really positive news back on the kids. So, and that's going to continue to filter in, um, you know, over the next month. So we'll give a, we'll um, report that out next year to everybody about how things went. And in the next section of the presentation, this is what Lisa spoke about, where I have the opportunity to sit and meet with department chairs and discuss potentially new courses, as well as retired courses, courses that aren't receiving um, as many student selections as needed to run. So for applied arts, I'll just take on applied arts, do you mind? No. I, I already started talking, sorry, yeah. Lisa. Um, for this one, what they've added is just a different level, so they've added the honors levels for some of the courses. Um, to help challenge the students that are looking for that additional challenge in their coursework. They've updated some of their curriculum. They've included things like Czechology and some of the work you've heard me speak about previously, making the work more relevant and applicable um, to the walls outside of Algonquin. And they're, do, they're gonna be offering that great social media marketing class. I mean, incredibly relevant mm -hmm. with the amount that we are, you know, everyone is utilizing social media. So I think it's gonna be great. They're gonna have um, a simulator a program yeah, the that program simulates, um, you know, a marketing experience through social media. Um, it sounds fantastic, but the kids are really going to learn how to apply the things, you know, that they learned in marketing to social media, um, which I think is a fantastic opportunity for our students. We're excited for it, and I think the students will be really excited as well. And the benefit of the program is they can try all of that out offline before they commit to posting something <laughs> publicly. Safe learning space. Uh, I alluded to um, retiring a course, English. Ms. Bitar talked about retiring one of her courses and bringing in a new course offering. Actually, we discussed bringing in two new course offerings, yep. but through some further discussion and working with myself, uh, her peers, bringing it back to the department, uh, following up with guidance and what the um, course selections were, they decided to go with one new course next year. Comedy and satire, I think that's gonna be a fun course. They're gonna spend a lot of time you know, looking at humor and how it, you know, impacts um, just, I think, overall our lives through literature and media and film. And um, we've actually are have, getting a lot of requests for the course. So I think students are really going to enjoy exploring that. Which I think is going to overlap the history positive psychology one when we get there. Again, yes. the humor, yes. the happiness. Yes. For math, this has been, um, a year-long process for us. We've gone back and looked at the curriculum and really want to promote the opportunity for upward mobility for our students. We want to make sure that if they come in or they struggle on a certain concept, all of us know the mathematical concepts we sign. Algebraic math is very different than geometry math. And so that if they take an Algebra One Fundamentals course, that they still have the opportunity to move up to that geometry CP, geometry honors, and challenge themselves depending on where they are in their math skills and depending on the actual math content. So they've worked diligently to take another look at the curriculum and take uh, the course and align it with some of the other tracks so that students have more opportunity to take a variety of math courses when they get into their junior and their senior year. So that's what the new course offering is, is, is a little restructuring to promote that upward mobility. All right, so the science department has just a couple changes and very positive. Um, it's a little busy, but I thought I would put it up there so everybody could see it. The science department in regards to their AP science courses have actually lowered the prerequisite to be able to get into their AP science courses. So formally, you know, AP biology, you had to have a B plus or better in honors biology. So they actually lowered that to a B. Same with the chemistry, environmental and um, the physics. So that's good news. They wanted to lower that to provide more opportunity, greater access for students to be able to enroll in the AP science courses. 
In addition, they've made a couple name changes. Those are only name changes just to kind of align more with um, the math courses. Um, they've always called things like biology concepts, real world physics, but yet they had chemistry fundamentals. So in order to align all of these courses, they just changed their name to biology fundamentals, chemistry fundamentals, and physics fundamentals. I, I spoke briefly about this one. These are two new course offerings, very exciting, very fun. Um, they're both uh, mirrored in the English department, so for positive psychology, Lisa just spoke about the course, and then Race in America overlaps Ms. Philbin's course, I'm blanking on it. Um, oh. Now I put us both on the yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll come to me in a minute. Science Voices. Science Voices, where you take on some of those very difficult <laughs> topics that um, our students are faced with every day. And so they're, they're offering these now in the social studies courses. They expand their elective opportunities for students. And again, we offer these courses so that students can take that time to see what really fits with them. It doesn't mean that we run them, it's based on the number of enrollments of students, but I think it's really important that students have the opportunity to see what is available to them. And last but certainly not least, the World Language Department is going to be offering a slightly different course and they're going to be putting more of an emphasis on history. Now students, of course, will continue to be, you know, um, speaking the language, but they're going to learn a little bit more about Spanish and Latin American history through film and literature. So that I think will be a nice opportunity for students while also still engaging them in the language. That's great. Yep, that's great. Yeah. So that's just an overview of updates and changes <laughs> that for this year. Thank Do we you. have questions? Um, that was a great presentation. Um, so on that Spanish, class the last one is that is that going to be like um, like at the beginning or would like seniors who aren't going to take it's, a it's language? primarily seniors yeah. seniors it's primarily okay. seniors who so will be taking Spanish. if they have that I could have told my son he's going to take four years of I Spanish could have, yes. could have. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been able to persuade him yeah. to take that fourth year of Spanish possibly yeah um, but that that was great. Um, to see Not as fun stuff. as the arts presentation. Our stuff, <laughs> our stuff is a little drier. I mean, we thought about putting it to music, but it just wasn't working. We were not able to pull the song together. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right presentation to ask this, but um, for the next time, like we have a guidance presentation, I'd I'd be really interested in knowing because. You look through the program of studies, you see the departmental presentations that we've had. Mm -hmm. I'm blown away and decided that high school is wasted on 16-year-olds. <laughs> and that, you know, you should, you should have high school for 50-year-olds. But, um, but, I mean, we're giving them so m many choices and such phenomenal opportunity to sort of expand their, uh, experience, their high school experience outside of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I'm curious as to... Uh, if we have any data as to how, how much they appreciate it. So do we, do we analyze how many kids are taking studies where they could take electives, right? Because I basically held my kids' feet to the fire and I said, these are fantastic electives, you're going to take them. And no, <laughs> second term senior year, you can have one study. <laughs> That's it. Because I, th I honestly felt that way. I was like, this, this is an incredible opportunity. So. But I also realize that not many parents are like me. So I'm just wondering what we, do we have any data that could determine, um, and, and would it show us also if, like Amy was talking about singletons, you know, if something like that is happening and that we could get more students, or we could get this opportunity to more students if changing a schedule, and trust me, I get how complex that schedule is. So <laughs> I realize what the question I'm asking, but I just think it would be interesting to know, you know, how many kids are taking studies versus taking um, advantage of all these electives that we. I mean, I, I really think for the underclassmen, the numbers are smaller. For studies. The numbers Correct. are significantly okay. yes. smaller for the grades nine to 11. We get to senior year 
and everybody <laughs> is like, I need a study. I need Absolutely, a lot yeah. of study. Yeah. Because of course, then they have the opportunity to participate in senior mm. privileges. Yes. Yes. So we kind of swim upstream with um, the studies as mm -hmm. seniors. So we do have a lot more seniors. We'll have students who do not have a study their entire time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and then senior year they'll have a study. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our students do you know, um, fill their schedules. Mm -hmm. So taking 35 credits, you know. Um, you know, sometimes we're not able to fit all the pieces of the puzzle sure. together in a schedule, you know, and students will come down and we'll offer them available courses. Like, okay, you know what, this is what is available. This is what we can do, you mm -hmm. know. We try our best to move other courses to, you know, right. accommodate um, an elective that they might like. I mean, we spend a lot of time no, I appreciate you do. Yeah. And like accommodating requests. And sometimes students, you know, just will say, oh, you know what? No, I'm all right. I'll just take a study. Mm -hmm. So um, so we do our best, um, you know, to encourage any student, you know, and try to get them into an elective. Oh, I'm sure you absolutely yes. do. That's why I was wondering if there's actual data that says, you know, freshmen take on average this many studies or, you know, what, however you would accumulate that. I'm not, I'm not even sure. We don't do it on a, on a yearly basis. Okay. Um, we did do it, I did do it with um, when Tom Mead was here like three years ago. Mm -hmm. Was it four years ago? <laughs> okay, I was like, I'm trying to think, how many years? So it was about four years ago. And we, we did find by surveying the students that the majority of the kids were in a study by choice. Mm -hmm. okay. For that mental um, break. Yes, yep. yes. Okay, yep. good. Yeah. But we, like I said, we don't do it every single year. No, I, I, I appreciate how complex it is. <laughs> <Trust> <laughs> Paul uh, Desmond. Uh, I, I too was just blown away by the, the course offerings, and you know it seemed like you could easily spend six years here and, and, <laughs> and stay engaged. Um, but I, I want, I'm also concerned about just stress for these kids. You know, especially you know, all these high achievers taking all these AP courses and that. And to what extent is the guidance department? You know, it seems like you guys would be on the front lines of sort of policing that. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you're dealing with it. Well, it's, I mean, that's been our existence for like the past three weeks now um, as we're trying to work with the students around their course selections, you know. And our focus is as long as you're enrolled in, you know, those core content areas, right, it's okay if you explore your interests in other areas. You know, so we make sure that they have their core courses for graduation. They've got their math and the science and the world language, history, and we actually encourage them. We'll talk with them our entire sophomore workshop. We have them do, you know, career assessment, do what you are based off the Myers-Briggs. We have an entire worksheet that we have them work on, identifying their strengths and potential careers, majors, course offerings that might relate to that and then encourage them to, you know, pursue those courses as well as, you know, whether it's the arts, whether it is, you know, continuing with band or music. And we help them, we have a four year course of study um, that we do with the kids as well. So oftentimes out, we typically, when we see it happen is sophomore to junior year. That's when we see kind of the stress level jumps and then the kids start to kind of worry about their course selections. And so we'll sit with the kids and we'll say, well, let's not, just, let's not just talk about junior year, but let's talk about senior year as well. You know, because maybe you don't necessarily need to have that, I think somebody had said something about AP Psych earlier. Maybe you don't need to have AP Psych in junior year. Let's go ahead and schedule that when you're finished with your world history for your senior year. So you continue to be in those core, enrolled in those core content areas, right? And you have the rigor but you still have opportunity for other elective offerings, whatever that might be for a given student. So we encourage them to look at the two years and let's map out the two years and see how we can you know, fit the different courses in and balance your stress. And another thing that we've done, it started last year, is the course offerings can be a lot, maybe overwhelming, and you, and you may become hyper-focused on those core courses. Um, you heard Amy speak about this earlier. Uh, beginning last year, we started it with the arts, where during course offerings, when they're selecting their courses, we literally make the arts come alive. You can go and try something that you may have gotten away from, like uh, sculpting or painting or music. So then that way, when you're, when you're making that choice, you're remembering the love of other things. Um, that started with fine and performing arts last year. This year, we added in applied arts. 
so that the page comes to life for you, so that when you select something, you're also remembering your spark and your passion. Thank you. Paul. So, I mean, thanks for this. I, I you know, it's, it's astounding to me how the, the, the faculty and the department heads and the administration of the school just constantly keep moving the ball and just making it better and making it better. And it was good to kind of peek behind the covers and see the kind of the process that goes by. Every year we hear department heads come and, and give us presentations and they're always talking about new classes that they're offering. And it's interesting to see how it all happens and I think everyone's to be lauded for that. And, you know, I was on a committee uh, maybe a dozen years ago here where we started talking about rank and, and, and grade point averages and, and all that. It's so glad to see rank has just gone from, from this process. It was, it's, it's been a long time under discussion. It's good, it's really good to see. And um, I do have one question though. So they have to pay for, take, to take the AP test as early as November now in the school year. What, what is the cost these days to take an AP test? Do you know? And where does that money go? College boards. To call, not to not to us, right? No, it goes to this. This is pretty interesting. Okay. Like ten dollars each. Each. Yeah. If you're late, you have to pay an extra. Yeah. Month. Yeah. This sounds like a money yes. grab. Right? <laughs> and it's, it's the big change here is it's so much earlier. That is a huge commitment for our students to make back in November now. <laughs> yeah. A couple right. months. Yeah. Yes. yeah. They want and to make sure they, off, they will yeah. offer a partial refund. Um, oh, that's good. You know, if the student <laughs> decides to opt out, but it's still hard. It's it's a big decision to make in right. November. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there were, uh, trust me, I went to one of the college board presentations for this purpose alone, and there were a lot of area directors there, and we were all up in arms, like, come on, you know. Right. Um, but they did not budge, and so. Um, this is the protocol. The now we have to follow it, or we won't have exams in May. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for a lot of our students, you know, that's important. Kathy? Yes. Um, so I have, I'll have a senior next year yes. who um, said when she was doing this, she's like, I've never had a study. But, and hopefully she won't, but <laughs> the 11th piece of it, on when they used to by paper, you could put one, two, mm -hmm. yep. Can you, could they, and I know I should have been part of the process when she was doing this, she did tell me what she was taking, but um, <coughs> can you say like what you're strongly wanna do versus not do, or do you just list the electives that you would like to do? So you, do, does that make you sense? Can, yes, you can do both. And you so you, there's a comment box where you can type in what you want okay. your priorities to be. Okay. Right, so you could say number one, psychology, so number two, her, so ceramics. Okay. Yes, and then a bunch of students have, you know, I mean, they get nervous around the process, so they send us emails. I just want to make sure that we have this right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they okay. list all their so courses for us. Stuff, it did, <laughs> yeah. And it did want to comment because she does have a. Yes, okay. and if she has a priority, I think it's there important to know that because sometimes courses conflict. Mm -hmm. okay. And you know, and then it's not being left up to the counselor. And we share this with the students as well, you know. <clears throat> um, so we do have a bunch of students who are sending us quick emails saying this is, you know, this is my priority right here. And we're wow. like, okay, we got it. Wow. <laughs> and the counselors all have, they keep spreadsheets and everything with all the information in it. <laughs> sure. Um, I have two questions. The, uh, uh, so the hundred and ten dollar fee is there? Is there? Uh, we were talking about the boosters earlier. Is there some mechanism for students who may have some financial challenges paying that? Yes, there always is. Yeah. I mean, that's like that's like any um, you know standardized assessment. <coughs> you know, the SATs, the ACTs, <coughs> students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. um, or in a hardship. Yes. Yep. Great. Um, good to know. Um, the the other question is, uh, or well, thank you for explaining the whole change to the grading and why that yep. that was, yep. uh, you know, very clear and, and it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I suppose that's then going to mean a lot of work as that grade level goes up on calibration for teachers. So their um, grading is, is is a difficult process, but calibrating um, that grade level to make sure they each teacher is grading similarly. To, to understand that? Um, so for college, so the, the grading process, I know that they work in PLCs and they cross um, converse about the different assessments. Some programs have common assessments, some don't. So they discuss the grades within them, but I don't think I quite understood your question, John. Um, 
it's I would assume it's going to be some mind, a mind shift for some teachers for the because, grading scale. Yes. yes. So in uh, I would expect then you know a lot of conversations to to be had in not only inter department but across uh, departments to make sure they're grading similarly, which is always a challenge anyways. Yes. And so we did <laughs> roll this out and explained it, but I agree with you. Um, like Lisa mentioned about rank, we have some um, preliminary data on what was used for A pluses and D minuses and some qualitative data on what they've heard about this process as a freshman class. We need to revisit that at the end of the year so that we can continue that work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the dance. Very informative. So the, I assume this was, a, you mentioned that you didn't have an update per se on the class rank, but was that incorporated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just worked <laughs> it in here because I figured once we were done talking, we were talking about um, yeah. GPA. I like to have two check offs. So really <laughs> we're in the right. middle of rank, so we have no update. <laughs> Thank you. Update when we have more info. So the next item is the student handbook review so yes um, good evening so you may recall that last year we had a handbook review committee comprised of administrators and teachers and parents and students and we basically spent four months reviewing revising and updating the handbook um, it was a great process that we went through so all of that work last year made this year's review that much easier um, just a note that legal counsel is currently reviewing the proposed handbook for any revisions due to legal changes. So as soon as that comes in, I'll make sure to get it out. Um, I pointed out three main changes in the handbook that you got on the summary. Mm -hmm. um, one, we may have mentioned briefly last year as we were thinking that this was an administrative, uh, we, we spent quite a time, uh, bit of time as a team discussing looping and how we wanted to be with the students so what we decided last year and we implemented this year was assistant principal looping basically means for example this year the class of 2022 I was um, I am their assistant principal and I will stay with them through all four years okay. yeah, I think it develops a more meaningful relationship I know the kids the kids know me um, and that continues through the whole four years um, so next year will decide who picks up the class of 2023. Usually it's the senior assistant principal who loses a class. Um, under student behavior, we found that there were, in the handbook, five different areas of behavior. And we said, well, hey, <laughs> I think it all just goes under school behavior. We have um, a common set of expectations for everything and everywhere we do it in the school. So we combined it into student behavior. And then there was one line we added under out of school suspension um, that's listed there. Those were the major changes. A lot simpler than last year. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we will have a chance to review it um, and we, we vote to approve this at some point, right? Um, so next month. Next month. All right, so next month we'll be voting to approve this. It's great that we have the opportunity to have that chance. I know some years we would get it and we wouldn't have a lot of time to um, review what we're looking at. So um, any questions or things that you may have as you're going through it, uh, let us know. And next, year, next month we'll, we'll vote on it. We're not presented tonight, but I see... Um Mike Massimino is still in the audience at the booster meeting. Uh, prior to that, he did share that the Athletic Handbook Review Committee has done masterful work, and he will be on the agenda next month to present changes to the athletic guide. We'll All right. that down before. Okay. All right. Now to the superintendent's report to the committee, and Sarah comes on again. Yeah, stay on that side of the aisle. <laughs> it's great teamwork. Um, what's exciting about this month's principal report is that we're able to bring some of the students to life off the paper. So for example, I mentioned a few reports ago that I was starting to include the student work wherever I could, kind of in the upper corners of the principal's report. So 
That is Leah's work that you see at the top of this month's report, and mm -hmm. Leah was the one who presented out. I also want to say that, and someone had mentioned, I think it was Dan, about speaking to a large audience at such a young age. Leah was our eighth grade parent presenter for that night, in which she spoke to all of our parents um, from all visiting eighth grade schools, Mellick and Trottier and surrounding private and charter schools, and had a similar presentation that she did tonight. Truly a stellar uh, student individual. So it's great when you can take that name and that person and the art that they do and bring it to life. Uh, towards the bottom of academics, uh, it's fun to see Miss um, Honey, our librarian, take Canvas and find a way to launch it in the library. So you see this happening often. 100% of our teachers are now on Canvas, leveraging Canvas, um, taking the classroom outside of the classroom walls. And Kim has done the same thing for our library. I've got the opportunity to um, participate and observe some of her lessons in which she does this work and she shows students how to come do that Google Hangout, how to learn that database. You know, some of those research projects, I'm not gonna say all of our students do it, but some of them wait till the last minute and so they have that one-stop shopping that can help them get the work done, de-stress, make it really easy for them. So that they can access the library on the weekend whenever they need to do it, they do it through Canvas. One of the many opportunities that Canvas has brought to us. Under activities at clubs, I wanted to go back to robotics. We got to see their uh, robot, the competing robot. It did very well. They had quite a few challenges on the day of competition. They ended up coming 19th as a final position out of 30, 38 qualifying teams. And I know we spoke about you know, how long it took to model some of those pieces. Again, it's really great to see the students come to life for us. Um, and they're, they're going on in their competition. So just wanted to say congratulations to them. They've qualified in the district um, for the next round. There is the picture of paint night. Uh, I know Amy presented some of those pictures. And speaking with some of the students, I think Ms. Shepard is here. She was there that night helping to run it. She told me a wonderful story where the students felt extremely empowered and that they got to teach and educate the teacher. She referenced a student talking about all the feedback they may get on one of their essays or English assignments, and now they have the opportunity to <laughs> repay the gift of education. That's how I saw it. Um, but it was just fun to see the dynamic and the opportunity that Ms. Shepard created to build those connections. So I wanted to point that out. Uh, on the second page, it, it comes from the first to the second page. I just want to take a moment to talk about Life Skills DECA. It has really grown over the last year and a half. Uh, this year alone, they've done a lot of entrepreneurial work. They've done multiple competitions. Ms. Geigitz is continues to foster and support the program. They have multiple speakers. They have a speaker tomorrow, in fact, um, to inspire the students and give them different ideas. The Money Barber, great business, uh, awesome. Um, commercial if you're looking for that individual barber experience but our students who are running some of those DECA entrepreneurships are then coming to work with our life skills DECA students so that great collaboration and um, mentorship. DECA of course as always stellar performance 108 students competed um, in states with 33 finalists uh, again no shortage of metal coming off the bus when they came back. May 18th, got to put my plug in there for prom. Prom season is starting. Black and white old Hollywood has been voted in. I do want to take a moment and thank our APTO and um, DA Early. They recently won a grant award to help fund the junior post prom party. They have to raise a significant amount of money and it's great to see the community come out and support us in that process. And super kudos to APTO for taking that initiative to take it to the next level. Tickets go on at sale in April. Got to put that plug in there. Um, something that we started, it's, it's Inclusivity Week has been going on in Algonquin for quite some time, but something new that, that we did last week was we did a interactive presentation where we talked about acceptance and awareness. We created a panel, a discussion panel where teachers all discussed where they maybe didn't feel included or different, allowed our students to see those educators that they connect with struggle and answer those questions. Um, combined with that, there was a great video and talked about how students were accepted. So we're trying to take some of the great initiatives by Best Buddies and make them all school. Um, in the athletics, uh, again, A.D. Massarino continues to lead the field, charge the field on this one. Coach Fedak received one of the highest forms of recognition. She earned the Jack McDonald Award for swimming and diving. She's a stellar coach, stellar educator, retired from Algonquin, is here every day as a sub, just a true role model and mentor to our athletes. Um, Thank you to Mr. Spataro and the Boosters. They are always there to support us, as you hear A.D. Masarino talk about frequently. Uh, speaking of school spirit as they make this shift, the DECA students, for the second year in a row, we had to do this last year, great coordination with athletics, um, took a bus all the way back from their competition, yellow bus from Boston, back 
to watch our basketball, our varsity boys basketball team play. I mean, that shows the level of commitment and support that we have for each other. That's a long day for them. They compete all day, they get on the bus, they come here, they cheer, and then they get back on the bus to do more competitions tomorrow. So that's towards the bottom. Uh, Tess Reyes, I would not want to challenge in a race. I, I thought I could take her for a little bit, but she just posted seventh place at New England's and broke the two mile school record. So at Apple Fest, I might line up behind her in the 5K. I'm just going to be honest, <laughs> as competitive as I am. Cheerleaders are at it again. Um, game day at States on Sunday earlier this month. Their uh, performance team finished ninth for the state competitions. Excellent, excellent performance. And as we know, they're going on to compete in regionals and so forth. On our third page, I wanted to jump down to student support. Andrew Roberts is a freshman this year who has a huge passion for sports. And he was the keynote speaker at Visions of Community 2019 conference. I got to watch the video of him speak. It's inspirational. It's motivational. He used something that he loved, and he continued to grow. Um, Andrew Roberts has been with us for his entire academic career. Marie Allen is, is um, very aware of the talents of the student and very supportive of him. And it's great to have him join Algonquin and do the, the amazing work that he does here. He also works with North Gold Cable Access. He works with some of the students on their shows that they go ahead and perform. and. Um, video and share out. Ms. Collins spoke briefly about some of the awards received. I just want to go back and reiterate it. Again, we have Mr. Vincent still in the audience um, for the amazing work at the um, Jazz Festival where ARHS Jazz 2 performed with the silver and Jazz 1 performed in Tacoma the gold. That is a true testament to not only the commitment of our students and our parents, but also our faculty um, because it shows in the successes that our students earn. On the last page or the fourth page, just a quick update, we had career day, huge success. It's something that's grown each year at Algonquin. It's part of our school improvement plan. It's so big now that we have to split it between departments over two years ago. It says 85 career speakers. By the time all was said and done, we had 92. The number just keeps growing. And with that, our faculty members, our students, I know myself have made some business community connections. I'm using one of those business community connections to bring in some professional development supports on a professional development day next week. Students are, are setting up those supports for internships and continued work and answering questions. A truly stellar opportunity that we've continued to foster and grow here at Algonquin. Uh, towards the bottom, we have English. I just wanted to put in the plug for the Algonquin Writing Center. I was able to witness this. I know I'd heard of it. I've seen of it. I know they're out there. <coughs> Algonquin Writing Center will send a commercial to your classroom. So they will have one of their tutors come to your room and talk about how you could use them in that project, that research project, that essay. It breaks down the barrier of having to go into the center and not know anybody. You get to make that connection in your classroom and then continue it outside of the classroom. True testament to the work that Mr. Zarnecki and Ms. Stein do. Um, and then under administration, I just wanted to revisit that something that Ms. Collins spoke about, uh, the spark. It's something that we started our school year with about um, really finding what inspires children, what's their spark, what's our own spark, and incorporating that passion into our daily work. You know, children aren't vessels simply to be filled, but fires to be lit is one of the quotes that I referenced there. And it, and it truly is how we look at our day-to-day -day work at Algonquin and our overall visions. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Lots going on, as usual. Yeah, as usual. <laughs> A lot of achievements. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. <sighs> Just humbling to watch all this stuff and hear all this. Okay, now we have um, enrollments in the packet. The truly invigorating, inspiring <laughs> discussions around finances that support all of this good work. Uh, we can move through this pretty quickly as we are status quo and on target for the most part. The enrollments um, are in your packet. No significant changes. Also in your packet is the general fund expenditure report. We are actually um, going into the month of April, slightly um, ahead of last year. Christine Tag has just returned from her um, Florida vacation where she maintained our accounts uh, strategically uh, from afar. She's never far away, even though she's in Florida. And um, she's a uh, getting caught up on all of the district treasurer work that prepares us for the end of the year audit and the audit subcommittee meeting which um, we had hoped would have occurred before now there's no significant issue 
It's just that we wanted to wait for Christine to return as our regional treasurer. So that should happen within the next couple weeks. The revenue report um, also in your packet, both um, I would request a vote to approve until audited. So moved. Second. Moved uh, by Dan, seconded by um, Paul Bucca. This is both the revenue and the expense, or? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's what I heard. All right. Um, any questions or comments? All right. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Budget calendar. You know, we start at the beginning of the year and we have an ending point of town meeting, and Sad Day is Southboro, and uh, Northboro will follow it after vacation. So we're hoping for an uneventful um, town meeting in terms of questions and holds, but definitely uh, full support going on to the meeting, and um, hopefully we'll realize the same outcome at the meeting. But uh, South Road, Dan, is 1 o'clock, right? It's 1 o'clock. And uh, approved budget for distribution. So there's a lot of uh, good work on this document over um, the many months. And uh, the assessment document as well. No votes necessary on <coughs> any of those. I do have a letter. Um, we, we sign this traditionally to send to the State House for Chapter 70 review of um, Foundation Budget Commission's work. And if we could send that again, it's an annual send. This week, I believe they're having open session on the governor's budget at the Gardner Auditorium. So it is the season, and those changes to his proposed budget in January, I'm sure, will start happening. Again, all of our budget process is contingent upon his budget being passed, which we won't, you won't know until July or August this year. Okay, okay. so, all right. And so next we have our policy and development, uh, development and distribution. So we have our second reading on our advertising donations and sponsorship policy, which we've been working on. Um, yes. Is it okay to have a question? Sure. Um, in those that would not, that would be disallowed in terms of drugs, tobacco, alcohol, would this also be um, unhealthy type products as well? Soda, et cetera. The above definitions. Coke sponsoring Pizza Hut, et cetera. It's not okay. So we looked at a lot of advertising policies, and this was like the fault of like what everyone had for the policies. Mm -hmm. And no, no one had anything that had to do with food. Mm -hmm. so this is language that's basically lifted from MGL, right? I mean, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, food hasn't made it into Mass General Law yet. <laughs> so, Paul. So we talked last month about this, uh, and, and I, forgive me, I haven't had a chance to read this, but we talked about who sets the rates and how we charge. Has, has there been an update to address that? Question. It is a, a conversation that we did have at policy subcommittee that we really need to uh, take some time and develop the, the guidelines and practices around what the rates are we would um, charge for advertising and sponsorships and donations. Um, I think the, the major change from the last time we brought this to uh, the committee last month mm -hmm. was we added a lot more language around donations, sponsorships, and fundraising. We really tried to be more detailed in exactly what that meant. Um, that was the major change. And then to your question around food and, you know, sponsorships around, you know, healthy alternatives and so forth, I think we are, um, in terms of our, our guidelines of, of food and policy with our um, lunch programs and USDA, I think we would want to mirror similar um, guidelines in terms of advertising mm -hmm. um, so that we don't have mixed messages for students. So uh, hopefully what is, um, what is woven throughout this document is that 
the you know central office and the and the superintendent or his or her designee really has full control over basically anything that happens any any kind of advertising any kind of fundraising donations whatever so I think that um, I don't want to say that's implied that the superintendent it would be the one who ultimately would set the rates um, I guess my question to you is who else would do it <clears throat> where would the confusion lie I guess is my yeah. You're talking to me? Yeah, because um, you asked the question. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the confusion, I, I wouldn't think that there's confusion as much as there should just be consistency. I mean, if we're going to go out and tell the public, mm -hmm. all of the public, mm -hmm. that we're going to allow advertising, mm -hmm. and, you know, there ought to be some, I don't know, a cost sheet or, or something. And I'm just kind of wondering who creates the cost sheet. And, you know, typically, I mean, you know, the typical advertising rates are set by a number of eyeballs that see something or the number of ears that hear something. I mean, uh, uh, you know, are we going to... Are we going to, you know, how are we going to tie those rates to, to what we go out there and tell people? You know, if some bank wants to have their name on the scoreboard, okay, well, you know, how much is it? And do we, you know, come up with a number? Do we let them propose a number? You know, I, I, I think letting them propose a number gets, gets weird. I mean, it'd be nice to kind of have it, some documentation. I think it's like, um, this, we're not really it, sure, like, all the different kinds of things like you know it's not like you know when you have a program for instance and you you know have advertising for half page a quarter page mm -hmm. but then you also might have banners and so you could have general um, um, guidelines you know for size and I could envision something like that but I think we're not really sure what's going to come down the pike, like what's going to be, what people are going to be interested, what the boosters is going to be able to, um, what program they're going to want to try mm -hmm. to um, raise funds for. Um, so I think, I think other towns, have, like if you go and you look at other towns, like they've done like different, like gold, silver, like different categories levels. and then mm -hmm. friends of or... Like Westboro just did theirs, and if you go into their websites, they do have like different areas. I think our as a as a group, we were just trying to get language into a, the policy, and then we were going to work on <coughs> trying to figure out the rates up afterwards, type of thing. Yeah. But I think we we were trying to give this to the boosters too, mm -hmm. just for them to give us their feedback on, you know. What they thought would be, if there's something they want us to take out, add, or whatever. Yeah, there could be something that we're not thinking about and that they have in mind and, and it's not really covered. It's that kind of thing. I, I can't picture us going out and selling advertisement. I mean, it's yeah. going to be the boosters doing that or some other you know, nonprofit group, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's up to them to set the rates and you know, see what the market will bear, really. So I'm, I, I, don't know, I can't see having that policy, certainly. See, and, and so the other side of that coin would be, you know, somebody who's in an organization like the Boosters, and I wouldn't, I'm not suggesting that this would ever happen, but, you know, say there's a Booster executive who's, uh, you know, kind of a, a top guy at a local institution, and all of a sudden their name is plastered across the billboard at the football field, and some competing local institution comes knocking on our door and says, Hey, how much did that? How much did you get for that? How did? Why did they get it first? Or why wasn't it available for us to, to bid on? I, I just don't want to create those kind of conflicts. And and you know, in some of the some of the bigger things we're talking about, that that we may create conflict. I mean, you know, how we set the cost of a quarter page of an ad in a program. You know, I'm I'm fine with that, and it probably depends on the program and and how many people we think will buy it or look at it, but. Something big like the field, uh, you know, in particular, you know, or the gym, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we ought to have some control over that, and, and it ought to be it ought to be reasonably public. Just say, no, and uh, really, again, no disrespect to anybody in the boosters. I, I have no idea what any of them do or what their jobs are or what their ranks are in the different companies, but just uh, you know, as a as a potential example, uh, it's just that we wouldn't want it to happen. Ms. Johnson, I, I think Ms. Johnson had a comment to that. So I think all of 
all of this is and has been reviewed this policy has been something in the works for two or three years if not longer mm -hmm. we've talked about it conceptually and I think the challenge becomes we're not really in the business of you know marketing we're in the business of providing venues perhaps where organizations that support our work and our students our students first and foremost um, and the work that takes place um, is provided with more opportunities to raise additional funds and we've met, we've ref referenced the boosters it could well be Triam it could well be another organization that supports um, our students and I think the essence of this policy was to get us positioned to begin to do that work and to make some determinations in collaboration with the organizations that are coming forward because they're going to really be doing the work we're going to be overseeing this and there's extensive language in here that um, provides gatekeepers for the school district and definitely the regional school committee to oversee this we keep referring to the superintendent ultimately and designee ultimately our report is to you and so I think this policy provides for that period of exploration not exploitation as we begin to develop um, and fill in some of the questions that we don't even know yet to answer it's just allowing us to engage in the process we agreed in the subcommittee that this would probably be a policy that whether or not there's an issue is reviewed on an annual basis just to keep us current and to have an exchange about what we're seeing as opportunities uh, you know when we sat with the booster organization not just over this policy but over the years you know we started asking them what are you thinking about in terms of opportunities that you want to make available through your work um, so case in point the golf sponsorship we don't oversee that now in terms of how they use Algonquin as a fundraising opportunity to support our work and so I think having that purposeful dialogue so we can continue to monitor our work will allow us to answer some of the questions that have been posed tonight but, but until we take a step to do some of this work together we won't we won't know all the questions and we won't know what the rate structure is so it's to me it's a little bit different than a facilities rental where we have custodial costs and other kinds of direct costs associated with the activity mm -hmm. in the event so we're still working on that hi Jim you still there I'm still here we're still working on that <laughs> together and just today we're like we got to get this to committee this is a little bit of an intangible that we we aren't as quite familiar with so if the booster organization wanted to say hey we just put up a great new scoreboard and we think it would be a great idea if you know Kathleen Howland wanted to wish your child happy birthday I don't know if we want to get into She'd the kill me she would <laughs> <laughs> and then She'll you wouldn't be now. here and so that's a bad idea but um, you know but so I don't know if we want to get into that rate structure discussion um, but rather the booster might want to want to work that out at their level and then come to us and say what do you think um, and it may change you know it might be a seasonal kind of event where we know more people are going to be at the football game so there's more visibility you know so that's what this allows and it's pretty exciting to think that we'll have an opportunity to have those conversations with people who support our work that we don't always have now like the boosters they just started coming to school committee you know on a regular basis a couple years ago um, and and now they're aligned with and for lots of good reasons what we're providing them with a list of things that we support which mm -hmm. is a change of practice and I see that just continuing to develop Kathleen um, so so I think that uh, we're at the stage where every situation is going to be new and different mm -hmm. so I don't know that we can come up with a rate structure per se other than just saying mm -hmm everything everything every proposal every uh you know idea must be approved by the superintendent mm -hmm. you know that's basically and it, and it may be a hundred hopefully a hundred different conversations right wouldn't that be great <laughs> so yeah, so my, my, my only point my, i think my only okay. point really is when they come to you and there's something of significance mm -hmm. you know i think i think a question needs to be was this made generally available to this company's competitors? I mean, and, and how was it made available to them? If it was local company ABC is going to give us 10 grand to have the name plastered all over the school board, well, was local company XYZ offered an opportunity to trump them with 11 grand? 
you know, or something like that. It just yeah. bad we, word. we had a big discussion too about you know size of you know how mm -hmm. big can the ad be, and I think the conversation came about what are, what is appropriate for the location that they have in mind, mm -hmm. and to have that conversation. I mean, we had it when we talked about um, the naming of, mm -hmm. of a facility about you know the banners they place on on the fence, and yeah. that was a very in-depth conversation mm -hmm. that took place here but also behind the scenes so it just gives us more opportunity to exchange uh, in, in an active uh, I've, way. I've had my say okay thanks but, Appreciate it. but in the policy we also did put like what the exceptions that right. we didn't have to approve but then when we fundraise what they do have to come with us mm -hmm. for i mean it's a five it's basically 500 or more but if it's a capital thing of five thousand or more they have to come for approval too right. Mm -hmm. And they have to buy by procurement laws and right. bidding. And to we, your point, Paul. And we they decide to review it yearly just because things will change. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. whatever comes about, it will. Right. I mean, some of our sporting events get a lot of people, you know, and there's, you know, and, and there's, a, there's, you know, a couple of well off communities that would be worth advertising in, in some of our events, you know. I, mean, I, don't I, think, money I think, too, it's like. <clears throat> There could be different campaigns and whatever the nature of the campaign, they could come up with different ideas. I mean, who knows what's going to be available in the future in terms of possibilities, you know. Um, so I think it's it's something that um, we're just trying to start. Somewhere. Just getting started, yeah, just see what it is, and like I think as time goes on, you might develop some consistency because they're not going to want to um, be inconsistent with. Um, their campaigns and you know people gonna say hey you know I donated this and got this amount for that amount later and now you're charging you know so you know I think um, I think it'll evolve and we'll start to be able to see some some patterns and I think it's fair to say we're not in the advertising business right oh I get that. <laughs> so that is something to be mindful of as well none of this is in a permanent name we made sure there was absolutely no connection to the name or the process right yes this is different so so this is the second read um, maybe we allow a, a week a month to, to pass so that yeah. everyone has a, chance, a chance to, to read it because it. it's changed Probably. since the last time mm -hmm. and, and Okay, that sounds like a good plan because I know some people didn't maybe have, have a chance to read wait it. Time and teach it. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, all right. So bring that up next month. Person distribution of personnel report. Oh, I skipped over audience sharing. Sorry. Any audience sharing? Yes. Thank you waiting. for coming. I think you need the. And I just want to make two statements um, tonight. I'm here both as a parent of um, Algonquin graduates. They're both in their 20s now and leading successful lives um, thanks to the school system. Um, that was one of the reasons we came to Northboro. And I'm also here as a taxpayer, um, and I want to see the same future um, generations receive what um, my children received from the school system, if not better. My daughter is a product of Algonquin's Fine Arts <coughs> Program, um, thanks to the wonderful teachers she had and who continue to be a part of the um, Algonquin academic staffing community. And I'd like to give my own accolades to Amy, and I don't believe she's here, um, for an outstanding job tonight um, presenting the program and the students. They were phenomenal, um, very articulate. I'm so impressed with our, our kids. Um, my daughter's experiences in education through the art department have been critical to her life, both um, developmentally and academically. Um, she, too, was a two-time Silver Key recipient, and she continues to uh, follow her passion in the areas of photography, music, and writing. She had an easier time getting into college uh, versus my son. Um, with her uh, art background, he followed a more traditional tract um, through Algonquin. Um, so I feel the arts shouldn't be minimized um, in their value. 
After Amy's presentation, the school committee seemed very supportive. You came across very supportive, yet proceeded to agree on budget cuts to the arts program. It almost seems insulting. Mr. Bunker, you asked Amy the question, what support do you need? And what I found interesting is that she didn't say teachers to support the program. So even if the scheduling issues that she brought about were resolved, as Amy mentioned, you know, could the department even support a higher demand of students based on the current staffing? You know, could, the, could they sustain accommodating student interest, especially with the, cutting, the cost cutting? So with that, I just had a few questions, and I don't believe they, they will be able to be answered because um, I don't know if the right people are here. But the first question I wanted to ask is how many teachers right now do we have in the art department? I think I can. Okay. <laughs> if you want to queue up the questions, I'll start on Sure. That. And um, the other question I had, and, and maybe um, with Lisa Connery here, uh, this could have been answered, but how easy do we make fine arts courses accessible to the students via scheduling? So in other words, I know, and, and I don't know if this has changed since my daughter was at the school, but fine arts courses would only be offered during certain periods of the day. So that makes it a challenge, you know, if they're only offered um, in the first and third periods and not available through multiple periods in the day, um, that can make it challenging. So here we are trying to encourage our students to take fine arts, but we don't make it um, very accessible to them through the scheduling process. And last, um, is kind of to a point, Kathleen, you had made, is if they ultimately can't get that course, do they end up in a study? And my guess is, is you know, and again, Lisa had said there hasn't been any data as far as, um, uh, you know, and it goes back a few years, as to students who truly decide to take studies versus those who end up in a study because they can't take a class. Um, it's kind of a, um, a dilemma, right? So here we are, we want to support the arts, but we have so many limitations. And then um, a, a kid who really wants to take the course ultimately ends up in a study. Um, my final question around that is, how many kids do we have in studies? Um, so in, a, in the course of a year, do we, you know, and, and what I look at, again, as someone who's making an investment in our education as a taxpayer. And my kids, again, subjected to it, do I want a teacher supervising or babysitting my child in a study versus being in a class where they can be educated? And there's so many phenomenal courses that are offered. And I, and I really find that, again, as another dilemma. You know, if we've got a lot of kids in study, then we have a problem. Um, whether it's not, you know, trying to uh, work through the scheduling dilemmas and conflicts, or again, giving them too much choice to say, yeah, you can sit back and kind of hang out in a study. You know, again, I, I would hope that the, the volume of kids in study isn't super large. I'm, I'm thinking maybe 5% of your population would be reasonable, but if you have anything that exceeds 10, 15%, it just seems like a, a problem. So those were my questions, my comments um, okay, for tonight. So do you have the answer on the Well, I, I think question? Sarah and I can piggyback on one another, and but I have, I don't know, Sarah, if you want me to respond, you want, how do you want to do this? I can, I can respond. So for the, you asked how many teachers there are in the fine arts department? Yes. So we have three that are uh, for music. So we have Eric, Amy, and Catherine. And for fine arts, we have Michelle, Danielle, and George. And, and George, Mr. Hansen's retiring this year. Correct. And he is not being replaced? 
he is being replaced at a point six. So this is where I can piggyback. Um, for the last two years, we had 6.8 FTEs. That's a combination of music and art. Right. Uh, this year we have 6.8. Next year we have 6.4. Same number of people, 7, re 0.4 reduction in FTEs. Okay. Which would be equivalent most of the time to two offerings each semester. Okay. And then the scheduling question. Okay. I'll piggyback on okay. your comments. Um, so the information provided was that from your knowledge, the art classes are only offered certain periods of the day. We do offer art classes throughout the day. Okay. And uh, through some of the phenomenal work, Ms. Shepherd's in the audience, we do some complicated overlays. But we do have singletons, like Ms. Collins talked about, that could conflict against other courses. They are offered throughout the day, so not just certain periods of the day. But again, we have conflicts. And do you have sufficient students? Right, well, you said singletons. So I'm assuming that term singleton means one student. I apologize. A sing that's scheduling lingo. <laughs> Sorry. A singleton is when you can only offer one section of that class for a variety of reasons, whether it's enrollment, whether it's conflicts, whether it's teaching staff. OK. All right. And then last about studies. Do, do you have any data as far as how many students are in a study in the I course of the semester? I can give a little semester? retrospective, because it came up several times mm -hmm. today. And um, Lisa alluded to an analysis that was done four years ago. And I think this is a, an issue that was also discussed by Amy. So about four, three or four years ago, we did a, a fairly intensive analysis of how many students were in directed study, whether they chose to, whether it just was by happenstance, whether they didn't get their first choice or second choice. So there's a lot of variability. And in some cases, students choose to take a study and they purposely study, you know, schedule that in there. And one of the ways we were able to mitigate that somewhat is to really have a purposeful um, intent on putting those point twos back in the schedule because a point two is equal to one class taught right. for the most part. And um, that would mean either a full year or a half year class. But a point two is equal to, for most cases, 20 students enrolled in a class. And we had a number of teachers that were at point eights. So we increased those to 1.0s through the budget process, which um, was purposely done to reduce the number of study halls. So, or, or students in studies, directed studies. So the numbers of FTEs haven't changed. This is really the first year we've had FTE equivalent reductions mm -hmm. from a 1.0 to a 0.6. Right. And so the staffing is, is in place. So that I think then that goes back to the broader issue, and I know Michelle Shepard's done a lot of studying uh, on this, and that is how we load in classes into the master schedule. When you have singletons and when you have a lot of singletons, that means the course is offered only once. And a lot of students are trying to get in that right. course. That creates more scheduling conflicts. Um, Lisa, um, Amy alluded to alignment with Mass Core. That's something that I know the high school is looking at, something they should pursue. Yep. It's been a long time since that aggregate elective amount of 27.5 was disaggregated among the class, uh, the content areas. So there's a lot of opportunities for some really active engagement and dialogue to happen to address some of the perhaps infrastructure conversations that should happen and the changes in the, in the program of study guide, which they're working on and doing a great job. You know, Sarah's put um, in some, um, she's engaged in conversations that haven't happened for a while. And I know there's a continuing um, desire to do that so it isn't just a 0.4 FTE. It is combined with those infrastructure supports and the scheduling review. Okay. Because we could put that 1.0 in as it has been and still have the same problem which was raised tonight. Right. So, you know, to have one fixed and then see how it, it works is a helpful strategy exactly. going forward. I agree. I mean, I definitely agree that you can't fix one thing without impact to the other. You know, I think it, you have to look at it holistically. I absolutely agree. You raised some excellent points. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank Congratulations you. to your graduates. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's always good to hear what our uh, students are up to. Thank you. Uh, I, OK, so now we have. Um, no, can I talk? Oh, oh, sorry. No, that's all right. Oh. Um, 
you know, just in, as a kind of a general audience sharing thing, we, the South Park Town Meeting is this Saturday, and we happen to have a member of the South Park Board of Selectmen here, and so I would like to just personally bring up the fact, and maybe some folks from Northbrook could could share this with any with any selectman that they happen to know that this will be Christine's last town meeting, and she has done, as far as I'm concerned, a terrific job leading this organization through through both good times and bad. Uh, with with grace and professionalism and, and and true leadership and I just would like to make sure that somebody kind of brings that up maybe in front of the whole town uh, in front of both towns actually over the next several weeks and um, no yeah I would prefer, <laughs> no I've often told I know you my would, father I know what you, would you prefer, got paid but, to do a job you do what you're supposed to do and then that's it I'm well thank you well, this is a different kind of appreciate too bad. It. Doing I appreciate too bad. It, but. There's different gradations of doing a job. <laughs> yeah, we, we will see how the, how the afternoon and evening goes, but uh, we will also respect your wishes you. on that. Thank you, the, Mr. Um, yeah, you have done an incredible, you have represented this district incredibly well at each and every town meeting. Always prepared, always professional. Uh, answer every question that is, that is asked of you. Um, and so, yes, we look forward to, you know, one last go. <laughs> <laughs> Not if it means holding the budget. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much. So you get up and do a presentation itself <laughs> at Northboro, so this will be your last one. <laughs> thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Any other audience sharing? Is anyone? Okay. Um, uh, distribution of the personnel report. Do you have anything? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's in the packet. Um, and communications, with the, the Foundation Commission mm -hmm. review letter. Um, is that what that? Yep. All right. Everyone gets an original this year. All right. And um, the annual report of the Northboro Southboro Regional School District. There's, there's also something in a binder. This, um, even though it says Northborough, it um, was di also distributed at uh, Southboro Financial Advisor. It's something we started uh, um, two years ago just to provide more information to our finance boards. It's been well received. Um, it's Northborough. In front of you, I will bring the Southborough because Northborough was uh, after we approved the budget. So Southborough is so early. We had a preliminary budget. Uh, in the packet, a recommended budget, not the final docs. Mm -hmm. This one includes the assessment numbers, um, and all that documentation is in there. But this is just, I thought you'd be interested in receiving it. Um, again, Financial Advisory and South and Appropriations was pleased that it's all in a very concise uh, format. And it's just a snapshot about uh, our budget process, but also the district as a whole. And this is all about Cheryl Lever. She's amazing. <laughs> she puts all this together, gathers the information, cracks the whip, and mm -hmm. there we go. Um, and we appreciate um, Principal Walsh's input in preparation of this, as well as Lisa Connery, who fills in a lot of information about college acceptances. That's great. Look forward. Good reading. Oh. Christine. Um, and Rota Webb <laughs> for the third night, uh, third year in a row. Uh, every year it continues to evolve. Um, she does a phenomenal job of pulling together all of her EL uh, teachers and support personnel to create an amazing international night, which um, this year she promises um, dance and music and no, speak no speaking. Uh, and lots more food. So how can you not want to go <laughs> know, to an event get like that? that. On the calendar. And nothing but people enjoying one another's company with no texting and no emails and just doing what we forget how to do, and that's communicate and speak directly with people. So it's a fun night. It's in multi-languages. In multi-languages. <laughs> 22, I think, mm. we said in the district this Wow. Year. That's, that's been quite a movie. Put that on my calendar. <coughs> Okay, so we have bills and payrolls that are going around, uh, agenda items for next month. Um, we're going to have the math department presentation, an MCAS update. Good for you. That's on the agenda. Um, <laughs> I think it's the computer based. The computer based testing, right. First okay. year for the high school. First year, okay. Uh, seal of biliteracy. There's Rhoda back. Well, 
right. with an update on International Night at the same time. Okay, and um, we talked about the athletic handbook and um, Mike will be back improving the stu student handbook and also bringing forward the uh, advertising donations policy. And for the first time that I can remember, we will be meeting after both town meetings. Ah. Mm -hmm. We'll be meeting because April yeah. is a five, four Wednesday, <coughs> and the right. town meeting in Northborough will be Monday, unless it goes for three nights, which is <laughs> likely. Yeah. We'll have an update on both meetings. Wow. All right. mm -hmm. First time. Wow. All right. So I think that's anything else any other agenda items anyone want? that sounds like it's in the agenda for next month mm -hmm. yes paul move we adjourn second <laughs> <laughs> move by paul second by dan all those in favor Aye. and it's unanimous